Hi, everyone. Jonathan Alexander here with the Los Angeles Review of Books. And I am just thrilled to have with us today Dr. Julieta Singh, who is Associate Professor of English and Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Richmond. Dr. Singh is also the author of No Archive Will Restore You, which came out from Plankton Books in 2018, as well as a Duke University Press book, Unthinking Mastery, Dehumanism and Decolonial Entanglements. She's got a forthcoming book of epistolary nonfiction called The Breaks from Coffeehouse Press. Dr. Singh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. You'll notice that I'm insisting at the moment on calling you Dr. Singh because we're recording this in the midst of the Dr. Jill Biden hoopla and totally unexpected question. I'd love your hot take on, <laughs> on all of that. <laughs> I always feel um, completely uh, thrown off by being referred to as doctor by other adults, <laughs> not, not, not least of which my students. So I always insist on Julieta. I had a therapist once for, for a very brief moment who insisted on calling me Dr. Singh and I just couldn't, I couldn't continue with her as a result. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, it's, it's a crazy world we live in. But Absolutely. one of the, one of the highlights I know for the last few years for me has certainly been, um, uh, being able to greet a fellow punctum author and uh, your book, No Archive Will Restore You, is really just a, a has been a phenomenal success in so many ways. Um, the book probably has many origin stories. One of them, I suspect, the uh, Antonio Gramsci quotation about the necessity of looking at all of the different traces that, that history leaves on our bodies, histories and ideologies leave on our bodies. Um, but I'm wondering if there are other origin stories, other, other moments that sparked the composition of this book for you. Yeah, the Gramsci quote is the, the sort of fictional beginning of mm -hmm. No Archive. I start with me being a graduate student on a sofa kind of stumbling into that passage through Edward Said and reading Orientalism for the first time and stumbling on this incredible passage where Gramsci kind of provokes us to think about ourselves as an inventory of, tra of traces that are impossible to gather, but it's nevertheless our ethical responsibility to kind of understand ourselves um, as, a, as a, a history of traces that we can't ever actually glean. In, in its entirety. And I think I, I imagined that at some point coming into a real sort of feminist awareness and feminist writing practice as a very embodied phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, but the other, the other origin story I think is, is, or one other origin story is that I, I wrote No Archive as a collection of poems, very shoddy, unsophisticated poems, um, as I was writing my first book, which was an academic book, I'm Thinking Mastery. And I was trying to think about the theories of mastery that kind of governed 20th century anti-colonial movements through figures like Gandhi and Franz Fanon and the way that across these like extraordinary political thinkers of, of the anti-colonial moment, um, all of these guys remained really wedded to the idea of mastery and having mastery over oneself and mastery over one's body or using mastery to oppose the mastery of colonization. So mastery became a kind of antidote to the thing it was trying to solve. Like if the colonial relation was a relation of masters over slaves um, or colonizers over the colonized, we needed other forms of mastery to fight it. And I was thinking about that um, incredible revolutionary global moment in, in so far as it's remained very sutured, I think, to our contemporary politics and the way that we imagine ourselves and our, our um, our political struggles as struggles in which we need to like capture and master systems or problems. And I'm trying to think very much against that logic of mastery in my own work from the most intimate kind of ways of conjuring or summoning or imagining the body to the biggest kind of um, crises that we're facing as a, as a species, as planetary species through global climate change. So mastery has been really important. And I think you No know, Archive is a very intimate, very personal way of kind of grappling with mm, a desire to grab hold of everything and to, and to become a kind of masterful subject and realizing that there's something vitally important about um, embracing the impossibility of that project. Mm, lovely. That's that's great. So there's so many threads we could pick up on. You know, one would be formally 
the mixing of creative and theoretical and academic forms of, of writing, mm -hmm. uh, which I think totally parallels what you just said. Not only does your book mix academic, creative, uh, theoretical, uh, memoir-esque forms of writing, that fully is reflective of your uh, epistemology or your method, what would say, mm -hmm. in, in approaching the work. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I'm, I'm curious, mastery is a, is a sort of mastering trope for you. Uh, it's as though the book is constantly reminding us that attempts to master the body are met with great forms of messiness. Yeah. Lots of messiness. And I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit more about, about how the mess, the messiness is generative for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, one of the things that I've written about across um, both my books uh, is the fact that mastery is phantasmatic, which is like we imagine ourselves as masters and we play into that masterful fantasy, you know, and, and one of the ways that I wrote about this in No Archive was to think about um, being a, a younger woman struggling with bulimia and the ways in which bulimia becomes a kind of like fantasy or any kind of eating disorder becomes a kind of fantasy of having full control over yourself and your self-representation. Um, and, and, you know, also through, um, everybody likes to, to joke about the way that shit always appears in my work in some form or another and, and true to form, it also, uh, apparently appears in my next book, but I'm never conscious of it. I'm always writing about shit and never fully aware of it. Um, but, but I think, you know, I was trying to think about, uh, the, the messiness of the body and the things that leak out of us or that um, are expunged from us, the things that we take in, the things that, that leave us, the things that slough off from us as part of that archive. And I think when we imagine ourselves as kind of masterful subjects as the sort of, and when I say masterful subjects, what I mean is the idea of the human that we've all inherited in the kind of Western enlightenment epistemology of what is the human. Um, we imagine ourselves as very contained and we tend to hide and shield those aspects of ourselves that undo that fantasy, right? And so we don't talk about shit and we don't talk about, you know, the more unseemly aspects of the body or even the details of, of um, uh, transmission of bodies through sexual and other forms of intimate contact. And so I think part of No Archive was trying to really abide by um, those things we're not supposed to think about or we're supposed to pretend don't happen to us in a kind of germane, um, everyday sense. You know, it, and what's lovely about the book is the sort of granularity with which you you do that and, and moving quickly from uh, a theoretical register to something which is very much about sometimes about shit, right? About about bodies, bodies uh, that are messy, bodies that are complex. Um, and yet it, this is not an archive of damage, right? This, right. Is not, this is not an archive that you have assembled, which is just about uh, bodies disintegrating. And, and I actually think disintegration gets a bad rap. Totally, 100%. <laughs> we, uh, we could use a little more disintegration sometimes. Absolutely, uh, yeah. But this is also a book about uh, uh, the messiness of joy in some ways and and the pleasure the pleasure in in bodies and i'm yeah. wondering if is is there a politics here for you i think the politics is is you know when you were talking about disintegration i'm with you all the way i love i love the kind of um composting um worldview you know of of recycling and reusability and um, I think for me, you know, I was really trying in No Archive to think about an ethics of exchange that is often un unwillful, uh -huh. like the, the ways in which um, in, a, in a very sort of feminist new materialist from the academic side perspective, but also just from like virtually any Indigenous epistemology um, or, or non-Western epistemology that we can imagine where we understand that we're actually all in um, extraordinary exchange all the time in terms of the, the exchange of, I mean, Corona is the perfect moment of being aware of that, that we're literally swapping saliva and molecules and exchanging viruses all the time. And, and that there, there is an ethics and a politics that um, that refuses that idea of us as like very capitalist oriented, autonomous, um, individualized and individuated subjects to think about us instead as in, in all kinds of forms of radical exchange that we're not actually aware of. And so I think 
thinking more capaciously and more dynamically about how we are always already in contact and refusing that idea that there is such a gross or great separation between me and the man I see outside my window walking down the street right now um, really changes the way that you orient yourself in relation to the world. Oh, absolutely. And I think your your example uh, the, of, the, of the virus and the pandemic is, is really telling at this point. It's in my mind, so easy for us to be tempted to naturalize this. Oh, you know, this is this is the virus, which is, and this is what viruses do, and these are in naturally occurring ecological flows. When in fact, while on one hand that may be true, on the other hand, the spread of the virus certainly was facilitated, from what I can tell, by globalized transportation routes, right? You know, so. Yeah. There is a there is a complicity here that we have to be aware of, and there are structures uh, yeah. that we we are subject to. Uh, it's one of the things I think that your book really kind of brings to the fore. Tell me a little bit about your forthcoming book from Coffeehouse Press. What are you working on? So I'm I'm I guess I'm not really working on it anymore because I finished the coffee edits last week when we were in touch about doing this little interview. Um, I um, it's a long letter to my daughter. Um, my young daughter, who's now 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 feeling very much a tween, but at the time it's like kind of six and under her early childhood education, and it's a it's a book that's a, a reckoning um, on the one hand with what it means to be raising a child in the wake of ecological catastrophe, um, and on the other hand um, about the status of brownness in a country that's so polarized in its discussions of race between blackness and whiteness and where a kind of brown politics might be situated in this global climate and, and um, political climate. And one of the beautiful things about the book is that it, um, I wrote it before um, George Floyd was murdered and before um, the coronavirus, but I revised it in that period. I was doing the final edits during that period. Mm -hmm. And so I got to sort of write into the book, the, the contemporary moment, but so much of that book was already anticipating the end of the world as we knew it and new forms of sociality that would have to arise through reckonings with um, the extraordinary structures of racism that govern our everyday lives and, and uh, the ways that we're living um, that, that subject us to, to great ecological and environmental harm. Mm -hmm. um, and so the book got, you know, the book got purchased right before uh, Corona and then got pushed back years into the future because the publishing industry went into crisis. And then it got pushed forward again because it's, it's um, you know, in conversation with the, with the current political moment, I think in ways that it, that it anticipated but couldn't totally know. Um, so it's a it's really a book about um, it's called the breaks because the sort of principle of the, the the conceit of the book is that my entire life is completely super saturated with um, uh, practices everyday practices that are leading us wholesale to the to the destruction of the earth and that pedagogy in the wake of that knowledge has to be something radically different that can't be seen as a kind of inheritance of like passing down my best practices and my knowledge to, to my child, but actually a pedagogy that's about refusing virtually everything that I know and everything that I do in order to pave the way for, for another world. Um, so it's a light, <laughs> it's a lighthearted book. <laughs> a comedy. A comedy. It's a comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds yeah. absolutely wonderful and I'm really looking forward to it. Julia, it's it's always a pleasure to to chat with you. Do you have a um, a recommendation for things that we could be reading? I always like to ask folks if if they're reading something that's blowing them away. Um, well, you know, I uh, funnily enough, um, when you invited me to do this interview, I had not yet read Saeed Jones's book, which is ridiculous because it was plastered over every bookstore that I had been to. But I just went to to a. a an isolated um, beach house for a few days and I brought um, Saeed's book with me yeah. and was totally blown away by it. So it's a it's a recommendation that's already in your horizon. It, it is. Uh, it, it, but it, I want to I want to like doubly and triply um, uh, recommend it to everybody. Signal boost as the kids say. Yeah, I think he might have been <laughs> my very, very first interview. It, he, yeah, totally that's right. Amazing book. I, I'm yeah. so glad it's out there. 
Yeah. Oh, uh, my friend, what a what a what a pleasure to see you. Uh, stay safe, and we look forward to your you new too. book coming you out. You too, Jonathan. Bye. Bye.